picture on the right, you will see that the sacral plexus, the sciatic nerve, right from its origin, histologically is two separate nerves. The larger part is the anterior tibial, and the smaller one is the common peroneal nerve. And these two nerves are separated by a septum, which is called the crompton cuvelier septum. So please keep this in mind, right from its origin, the sciatic nerve is actually two different nerves, the tibial component and the peroneal component, and it is enclosed by a common sheath, but separated by a septum. So on the left, this is the osteotomal supply of um, the uh, sacral plexus, a small element of the posterior hip capsule, um, the femur along the back, both the condyles posteriorly and the entire bones below the knee joint with the exception of the medial malleolus. Uh, coming to uh, myotomal supply, it supplies the hamstring muscles posteriorly and all the muscles beneath the knee joint. And coming to a dermatomal supply, uh, this area which is marked in red, this is supplied by the posterior cutaneous nerve of thigh, that is the back of the thigh, uh, by the uh, posterior cutaneous nerve of thigh, which I told you is a purely sensory nerve. And below the knee, virtually the entire leg, with the exception of this medial compartment, which is supplied by the saphenous nerve. So if you keep this particular picture in mind, you will know what the indications for a sciatic nerve block are at various levels. So the sciatic nerve, as I said, is the uh, largest and the longest peripheral nerve in the body. It can be blocked in uh, various um, places. So you can divide it into proximal approaches and distal approaches. So the proximal approaches, the most proximal would be the parasacral block. Then you can do the gluteal sciatic block. You can do a subgluteal block. You can also do an anterior approach to the sciatic nerve. And the most distal approach to the sciatic nerve at the junction where it bifurcates into the tibial and peroneal is the popliteal sciatic block. So these are the anatomical landmarks that you need to keep in mind when you do the proximal approaches to the sciatic nerve. This is the posterior superior iliac spine. That is the greater trochanter. Now, this is a line connecting both these bony landmarks. At the midpoint, if you drop a line by five centimeters perpendicular to this particular line, this becomes the insertion point for the gluteal uh, approach to the sciatic nerve, which is called the classical Labart's approach. Now, if you drop a line from the posterior superior iliac spine to the ischial tuberosity around six centimeters distally on this particular aspect, you would be able to do the parasacral approach of Mansu. So here you see the uh, sciatic nerve, which is exiting from under the piriformis muscle. The most proximal approach would be the parasacral approach. A little lower down, you can do the gluteal approach and a little lower down, you will do the subgluteal approach. Irrespective of what block you do, there are certain prerequisites which are important for a regional block. First and foremost, you must be able to take informed consent from the patient and the patient must know what he or she is in for in terms of the injections in terms of the local anesthetic and also in terms of the time it takes for the local anesthetic to act. Intravenous access, uh, needless to mention, must be established. Routine monitoring um, uh, is important. We must also uh, ensure that we have the local anesthetic systemic toxicity rescue kit in the theater complex comprising of 
one liter of 20% lipolipid. We must ensure aseptic precautions, despite the fact that we are going to perform a mere percutaneous puncture. Anxiolysis uh, depends on the patient's mentation, and we must always ensure that we document the procedure well, and if possible, uh, follow the patient for two or three days to ensure that there have been no complications that can be attributed to your block. Um, here you will see that this is the posterior superior iliac spine. That is the greater trochanter. This is the midpoint. This is the line that is dropped. The needle is being placed here. So this is the classical Labart's approach. And if you drop this line going to the ischial tuberosity, at six centimeters distal, this is the entry point for the parasacral block as described by Munso. Now, if you look at the responses to peripheral nerve stimulation, there are two components of a sciatic nerve, as I told you. One is the tibial nerve and the other is the peroneal nerve. When you stimulate the tibial nerve, you will get inversion of the foot or plantar flexion. When you stimulate the peroneal nerve, you will get eversion of the foot or dorsiflexion. So as I play this video, please uh, give uh, attention to all the responses. You will see inversion, eversion, plantar flexion, and dorsiflexion. That is plantar flexion. That is eversion. Plantar flexion again, a bit of inversion. So you should be able to keep this in mind. When you stimulate the tibial component, you will have inversion and plantar flexion, and when you stimulate the peroneal component, you will have eversion and dorsiflexion. And the moment injection of local anesthetic is made, uh, the muzzle uh, response um, ceases, and uh, this is what we call the positive branch test. So this is the entry point for the parasacral block of Munso. And uh, this was an approach that was uh, described by Munso in 1993. And this is the most proximal approach which targets all the branches of the sacral plexus and not just the sciatic nerve. This is a very profound block because the local anesthetic spills over to involve the pelvic splanking nerves, the terminal part of sympathetic trunk, and also the inferior hypogastric plexus. And um, Mansu has noted that in several patients, even the obturator nerve, which is a branch of the lumbar plexus, is also blocked. And uh, the peripheral nerve stimulation endpoint, as per Mansu, he said that if there is a twitch of the hamstring muscles, it is acceptable. But in clinical practice, we always look for a twitch at the foot. And the preferred twitch that we look for is plantar flexion. Ultrasound uh, became applicable to perform um, a parasacral block by this excellent technique that was um, introduced into clinical practice by Thomas Benston in an article in the British Journal of Anesthesia in 2011. He called this the parasacral parallel shift. Now, a line is drawn connecting the posterior superior iliac spine to the greater trochanter. And this is divided into two halves. The low frequency transducer is placed on the medial half of this line. And when it is placed here, this is what you will see. You will see a continuous line of bone, which is the ileum you will see the gluteus maximus and the medius. Now, if this probe is shifted inferiorly, parallel to its original placement and brought to this particular level, you see that there is a break in the bone. 
this would be the posterior border of ischium and this would be the sacrum and in between these two emerging from under this hypoechoic muscle which is the pyriformis would be the sacral plexus so this is how you would do it place the probe in this manner see the uninterrupted line of bone which is the ilium and then when you shift it parallelly to overlie this particular area where you see a break this would be the sacrum this would be the posterior border of ischium you would see the sacral plexus emerging from under the pyriformis so this is the placement of probe to overlie the ilium and you would see this continuous line of bone and after the shift you see this break this is the sacrum this is the posterior border of ischium and this here would be the sacral plexus so in this particular video i'll just play it this is the ilium that is the gluteus maximus this is the gluteus medius and this would be the minimus and as the probe is shifted parallelly you see the break in the bone that is the sacrum that is the posterior border of ischium you see this pulsation of the superior gluteal artery and that is the sacral plexus there so this is a small video which uh, i borrowed from vicent rock and So that is how the needle approaches uh, from lateral to median. And uh, once it's in the vicinity of uh, the sacral plexus, uh, you begin to make your injection. And uh, sometimes you will always uh, be able to see the pulsation of the superior gluteal artery there, which will help you uh, guide you towards the plexus. Now, if you come a little lower, you perform what we call the gluteal sciatic block. And when you use peripheral nerve stimulation, you will choose that point where uh, you perform the classical Labarts approach. But with ultrasound, it is a little more uh, difficult. Uh, this would be the ischial bone over here. This muscle is the superior gemellus. This huge bulk is the gluteus maximus. And this lip-shaped structure, it is not round here, it is lip-shaped because it lies under the bulk of the gluteus maximus, is the sciatic nerve. And lying in close vicinity would be the pudendal nerve and the internal pudendal artery. Uh, so this is how you would put the low-frequency probe and the needle. Uh, this here is the ischial bone. This lip-shaped structure would be the sciatic nerve. This would be the superior gemellus muscle here, and this would be the gluteus maximus. And if you go a little lower down, this is a block which we uh, perform quite often. This is what we call the subgluteal sciatic nerve. Here, the sciatic nerve is lying under the gluteus maximus, which is thinned off quite considerably at this particular level. This is the sciatic nerve, and it overlies the quadratus femoris muscle and it typically lies at the midpoint between the ischial tuberosity medially and the greater trochanter lateral. Now if you see here assuming that this is a hammock on which this person is lying for example there is a small hole here in the hammock and the buttock is protruding through that hole that would be the sciatic nerve which lies closer to the ischial tuberosity than the trochanter, the greater trochanter. So if you see here, this is the ischial tuberosity, this is the greater trochanter, 
This is the gluteus maximus muscle. This is the quadratus femoris. So it lies here closer to the ischial tuberosity. And this is a picture I got in a volunteer. This is the ischial tuberosity there. That is the greater trochanter. This would be the gluteus maximus muscle. This would be the lip-shaped sciatic nerve there. And this would be the quadratus femoris. Um, this is how you would uh, uh, make the surface anatomical landmarks. You would put your low frequency probe in this manner and you could put the needle either out of plane or in plane from this end or that end, depending on your comfort. Uh, this is a small uh, video in which uh, I performed this uh, block uh, several years ago. Uh, the needle will be coming out of plane. So this would be the ischial tuberosity, this would be the great trochanter, the sciatic nerve is here. The needle will be coming like this. It's coming out of plane. That's why you don't see the uh, needle. You can see the displacement it is causing as it is going through the gluteus maximus muscle. And when I think it's right, on top of the nerve, I begin to make my local anesthetic injection, and you can see the nerve standing out quite well. Now, in some patients, it may not be possible because of fractures or because of severe pain to turn the patient into the lateral position to perform the subgluteal sciatic uh, nerve block. And in these patients, it is good to do what we call the modified Raj approach. The lower limb is flexed at the hip and also at the knee. So you draw a line connecting the ischial tuberosity medially to the greater trochanter laterally. And at the midpoint, you place your needle and it is tilted medially so as to make contact with the sciatic nerve. The next approach is the anterior approach to the sciatic nerve. And this is exactly where you would perform. Um, this would be the greater uh, trochanter of the femur, and this is the lesser trochanter of the femur. And the sciatic nerve, when you do the anterior approach, lies in close proximity, just medial to the anterior trochanter. Now, previously, um, the anterior approach uh, when using the PNS was uh, performed by what was called the Beck's approach, which was not very, very easy to understand. Uh, the surface anatomical landmarks itself are so confusing. But with the ultrasound, it becomes a little easier. This is the inguinal crease, and the probe is placed eight centimeters distant to the inguinal crease. And the needle can go from medial to lateral, from lateral to medial or even out of plane. So this is what you would see when you do a cross section of the thigh at that particular place. This is the lesser trochanter and this would be the sartorius and just underlying the sartorius would be the femoral vessels. These would be the adductor group of muscles, the longus, the brevis and the magnus and just underneath the magnus and overlying the hamstrings over here would be the sciatic nerve. So this is how uh, you would expect to see the sciatic nerve. This is the lesser trochanter there and underlying the adductors, this would be the nerve. But oftentimes you don't see it as a rounded structure. It is more of a lip-shaped structure. And uh, this is the sciatic nerve on the left side and the right side in the same patient. This is the shadow cast by the lesser trochanter. These are the adductors. This would be the short head of biceps femoris. And this would be your hamstring muscles. And this lip-shaped structure here is the sciatic nerve. And this is on the other side. So it is quite easily identifiable if you know your anatomy quite well. And this is a small uh, video. Uh, this is the femoral vessel that you can see pulsating over there. This is the profunda because the femoral has already branched. This is the lesser trochanter. The needle is coming from medial to lateral in this case. 
and uh, these are the adductors there and uh, once I reach the sciatic nerve I begin the injection I make a small injection um, here but I see that I am quite distant from the nerve so I insert the needle in further and now I believe I am just at the nerve and as I begin my injection you will see that against the hypoechoic backdrop of the local anesthetic the sciatic nerve appears very easy to identify so that is how you would perform an anterior sciatic nerve block and the final approach would be the popliteal sciatic nerve i mean this is the easiest approach to the sciatic nerve either with pms or with uh, ultrasound and uh, this is the targeted area now this is the area where you see a unified sciatic nerve branching into the larger tibial nerve and the smaller peroneal nerve now laterally would be the biceps femoris muscle and medially would be the two muscles which is semi membranosus on the inside and semi tendinosus on the outside so before it is branched you will see a unified sciatic nerve in close proximity to the popliteal vessels the artery and the vein and here at this level you will see that it has branched in close proximity to the popliteal uh, vessels so this is where you would see the branching now you would uh, textbooks will write that it usually branches 8 centimeters proximal to the popliteal crease but that is not very constant sometimes it branches much higher and sometimes it branches even lower uh, which is why uh, ultrasound is very useful to identify the sciatic uh, popliteal nerve you can do it with the patient in prone position you can do it with the patient in a uh, supine position with uh, the leg which is flexed at the knee and uh, you can also do it uh, with the patient in lateral position now when you use a peripheral nerve stimulation you should be able to differentiate between the tibial nerve stimulation and the peroneal nerve stimulation i've used a stimu pen here i have not used a needle this is a percutaneous needle and uh, <coughs> That is plantar flexion, which means that the tibial component has been stimulated. And this is dorsiflexion, which means that the peroneal component has been stimulated. And it's very important to note that at the popliteal sciatic uh, level, the sciatic nerve is ensheathed by an additional uh, sheath, which is called the paramurium the paramurium goes all around the sciatic nerve and um, as you see here in this histological section at the level of the popliteal sciatic nerve the sciatic nerve is 70 percent connective tissue and only 30 percent neural tissue so that said uh, i want you uh, to see this video and uh, we will discuss it later. Is this injection permissible? I placed my needle within the sciatic nerve and as I inject the local anesthetic, you can see that the nerve is imploding. It's actually becoming bigger. But I didn't have any um, increased resistance. But despite that, uh, this is not permissible. Uh, we are not supposed to put the needle within the nerve. So where should you uh, place the needle for a successful block? The best position is just where the sciatic nerve has branched into the smaller component, which is the uh, peroneal, and the larger component, which is the tibial. And this, as you can see, is the paraneurium. The needle should go under the paraneurium so it should be intra paraneural but it should be extra epineural so that is the ideal position exactly at the place where the sciatic nerve has branched 
Uh, this is a small video that I borrowed from YouTube. <laughs> So this is a, a study which was performed in a cadaver wherein dye was injected under the paramural. So it is very important to be able to pierce the paramural sheath before we place the local anesthetic and perform the injection. So with this, I've uh, completed uh, this uh, lecture on uh, sacral plexus and uh, paraneural blocks, I mean, uh, sciatic nerve blocks. So if there is uh, any questions or any cases uh, to be discussed, uh, I think we can go ahead. Dr. Nazar, I think uh, one of your students was supposed to present a case. Sir, please unmute. Sir is no. Sir is noted. Sir, please unmute. Yeah. Now, and now it's audible, no? Yeah, it's audible. Shall we have the questions? There are a few questions in the chat box. Shall we have it first and then go to please, the case? Please, please. Oh yes. We will do yeah. that. The first. Uh, let me ask the questions from the chat box. Sir, uh, there is a question. Uh, what is the minimal volume of uh, drug? That, uh, that will be enough for sacral plexus block, especially when you use it with lumbar plexus block. Okay. Uh, when I do uh, both blocks together, I do it at least twice or thrice a week. We have a lot of sick patients in whom uh, we believe uh, doing a neuraxial block could be uh, inviting problems in terms of hemodynamic instability or sometimes uh, the patients are very frail. So the typical volume that I inject for a lumbar plexus is 20 ml, and I inject about 16 to 18 ml for a sacral plexus block. Because uh, we generally tend to combine lumbar plexus and sacral plexus blocks for hip fractures, and most of the uh, nerve supply of the hip, the anterior capsule, is from the lumbar plexus and only the posterior capsule is supplied by the sacral plexus. So I inject about 36 ml totally, 20 for lumbar plexus and 16 for sacral plexus. What drug you are using, sir? If it's for surgical anesthesia, my preferred uh, um, cocktail is 0.375% uh, BPMK. I take 20 ml of 0.5, 20 ml of 0.25 in a bowl, it becomes uh, 40 ml of 0.375. I don't use any epinephrine, I don't use any additives, but it has been described. Um, if you prefer to use any of those, you can. What about ropioacane? You used it in your practice? Not really. Uh, I have this um, fixation with uh, bifivacaine. Ropivacaine I use only when I put catheters uh, for post-op analgesia when uh, I want the sensory block to predominate and uh, the motor block not to be as much. That but, is 0.2 percentage. Uh, I use 0.2 percent ropivacaine for uh, continuous infusions through a catheter. But, but uh, ropivacaine is not a bad choice at all. But surgical anesthesia, you can have either 0.5 or 0.75, or you can 0.75, have... yes, you can. Okay, fine. Uh, sir, another question Indeed. actually you already answered was about adrenaline uh, 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 with the local anesthetic agent by Dr. Sankita. Usually adrenaline can, uh, containing uh, uh, or local anesthetic agent is, is not used for sciatic nerve block, is it? 
that was the question uh, adrenaline um, for proximal approaches i would not um, advocate because as you saw when you do a sacral plexus block uh, the superior gluteal artery is in a uh, very close uh, uh, proximity to the sacral plexus and uh, if you enter the artery you will know immediately but if you enter the a small vein then even when you aspirate you can have negative aspiration and um, which is why i tend not to use um, adrenaline for my uh, blocks it may uh, delay systemic absorption it may increase the duration of the block but again it delays the onset so my preference would not be to use uh, epinephrine uh, there is a question from uh, dr polo rafael our uh, hod of amala institute of medical sciences how will okay, we know sir. it is under perineurium uh, for sciatic operation yes sir um if you uh, do an ultrasound guided uh, block um when you put the needle outside the paraneurium um you will not see the drug enveloping both the components of the sciatic nerve you will not see the drug forming a, a donut sign around the peroneal component and the tibial component you will see that the drug is going around the single sheath so that is an indication for you to know that you need to just pop the paraneurium and then uh, do the injection bene one more point related to this this part so you said the sciatic nerve divides at different levels suppose yes. you are you you are branching into tibial and common peroneal is very high when you give a popliteal sciatic you will trace it up till the point of division or inject at a fixed level from the popliteal fossa what is your practice um the one point we need to remember is as we start to scan superiorly from the popliteal crease the sciatic nerve becomes deeper and deeper so uh, reaching the sciatic nerve is a bit of a challenge as you start going towards the thigh upper thigh so in such cases where i see a high division i would tend to stay around 8 to 10 cm uh proximal to the popliteal crease and make my injection there as long as i have gone under the paraneurium the drug will spread to involve both the components suppose you fail to get a stitch in spite of your piercing the paraneurium will you inject under ultrasound guidance or you will just uh, try for a stitch I would yeah, inject yeah. under ultrasound guidance because failure of a twitch is likely to be seen in uh, elderly patients who have diabetic neuropathy or they have a neuropathy for uh, several other causes and uh, sometimes in asthenic patients especially elderly patients the muscle twitch is not very uh, easily appreciable and uh, in some cases uh, the patients have had a four foot amputation already and yes. there you can't really appreciate the twitch of uh, in the foot so in such cases if i know that my needle is in the correct perineural position i would not be unduly worried that i have not been able to elicit a twitch okay continue bilen uh so while using pns usually we get a valid simulation but uh, but won't get positive rag test so how to proceed it is a question from dr venu from kali sir can you please repeat if you not getting a positive rag rag test positive rag test okay okay um see um basically what uh, a positive rag test means is that as you inject more and more local anesthetic the conductive area around the tip of the needle becomes wider and wider so the density is much lower so you need a higher current to get the same twitch because the conductive area around the tip of the needle has become wider so if your positive rag test is not actually a coming in even after beginning your injection 
you may just begin to think that a part of your needle is probably intraneural. You can just withdraw the needle a little and see whether it has disappeared. And the second thing you can do is you can turn down the current. See, normally we get the twitch at one or 1.2 milliamperes. And once we get the twitch, we are supposed to reduce the current to 0.4 before beginning the injection. But several times we don't do that. The moment we get a twitch, we are so happy, we ask the person who is assisting us to start injecting. So that could be one reason why you're not getting the positive Raj test. So one, tone down the current to 0.4 before beginning the injection. And two, even at 0.4, after you begin to make your injection, the twitch is not going, you're probably intraneural. Just withdraw the needle a wee bit and then uh, proceed with the injection. Thank you. Dr. Tony requested to share your thoughts on length of needle used and options available in obese patients. Length of needle in obese patients. Um, for sciatic nerve blocks, um, irrespective of uh, whether the patient is thin or obese, uh, we made it a standard protocol to use 100 mm needles. That's 10 centimeter needles. Uh, 150 mm needles are also available, but uh, uh, fortunately in our practice, we have not had such big patients that uh, with a 10 centimeter needle, we were not able to reach the sacral plexus. So I think as a general uh, thumb rule, uh, a 10 centimeter needle would be good for all uh, sciatic blocks in adults. But uh, for an anterior block, many of the books says you, you may need a 15 centimeter. Is Depending it... on how big the patient is. Yes, it is a deep block. You need to go almost eight to 10 centimeters, but uh, to date, uh, in my experience, uh, I must have done a few hundred anterior sciatic blocks. I have not failed to reach the nerve with oh, uh, the good. needle. But it's always good when you do deeper blocks to use both modalities, ultrasound as well as peripheral nerve stimulation. And if you get a twitch and then you inject, the chances of success is much higher. Sir, for a tibia fibula fracture fixation, only you are you are advising only sciatic block or sciatic block sciatic block with the lumbar plexus block. Uh, there is no need to do a lumbar plexus block. Uh, definitely, a sciatic block is indicated, and uh, along with that, you can just do a femoral block or you can do an adductor canal block, which is uh, blocking the saponous nerve, which uh, supplies the medial aspect of the leg. So a uh, sciatic block alone will not do. You will have to combine it with the block that blocks the saponous nerve. Suppose it's an, an angle fracture, uh, you can just block the saponous just below the tibial condyle also. Right, sir? Subcutaneous. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Another question, sir. Uh, Popliteal sciatic nerve block, any practice you follow to shorten the onset of action? No. I don't use uh, any uh, any uh, techniques such as uh, soda bicarb uh, yes. or any such. Uh, it is if you're using ultrasound, I think uh, the best practice would be to ensure that you pop the paraneurium before you uh, perform your injection. Soda bicarb definitely not. So other than soda bicarb, I can't think of uh, anything else barring doing an intraneural injection to hasten the onset of action. And intraneural injection, as I showed in that video, I did that uh, block in a patient who was going to have a below knee amputation. So in that patient, it was okay to go into the sciatic nerve. I did it just to record that uh, particular uh, video, but you should not be putting your needle within the nerve. Uh, Dr. Veena asked and asked about the uses of sacral plexus block for surgeries? Um, sacral plexus blocks, typically you don't do them in isolation. You would always combine them with a lumbar plexus block. And uh, the most common indication would be um, either um, 
a proximal hip fracture. It could be a fracture neck of femur, or it could be a trochantric or intertrochantric or a subtrochantric fracture. It could be a hip arthroscopy or a partial or a total hip arthroplasty. And in some cases where I have failed to uh, do a spinal in patients with ankylosing spondylitis, I have also uh, done it uh, for total knee arthroplasties. I have combined both the uh, sacral as well as lumbar plexus blocks. But it is a profound block, um, not definitely um, for beginners. It is an advanced level block. So uh, one would, I mean, exercise caution because um, if you go a little too deep, you have the peritoneum right beneath the uh, sciatic nerve and just under the peritoneum would lie the rectum. So uh, the rectum is lined by a plexus, as you know, which, which is why people get hemorrhoids and uh, they can be intense bleeding if uh, you go past the peritoneum and injure the rectal vessels. The next question is from past the state president, Dr. P. Sachidharan. And uh, how will you do an ankle block for procedures on salt? <laughs> ankle block, Not I'm sorry, I did topic. cover the ankle block. Um, ankle block, actually, uh, there's really no need for a PNS or an ultrasound. I mean, trying to use an ultrasound for an ankle block is, I would say, an overkill. Um, we just target uh, the five nerves, the saphenous, the sural, the posterior tibial, the deep peroneal, and the superficial peroneal nerves. And uh, it's more like a ring block, which is uh, performed uh, around uh, the level of the malleoli. Uh, next question is, in a thin patient, can we use high-frequency linear probe for paracycral plexus block? Possibly, yes. Yes, in a very thin adult or in a, an adolescent or in a child, you can use a, a high-frequency linear probe. It's just a matter of getting used to the image. So shall I add one point to this? Uh, one of the uses for the curvilinear probe in this uh, sacral plexus is that you can uh, simultaneously identify both the bony landmarks. Yes. In, in, in a single field, which may not be possible with a high frequency probe, right? In a thin patient or a young patient, <clears throat> it is possible. But then being able to appreciate the difference in anatomical presentation between a curved probe and a linear probe is something that needs to uh, be appreciated by us. So um, I tend to use... Uh, a curve probe always. I have a high frequency curve probe, which goes from three to eight megahertz, and the footprint is only 35 uh, millimeters as opposed to the C60 probe. So that makes it uh, quite convenient for me. Okay, sir. And the next question from Dr. Sankhita Kulkarni. Do you always block the saphenous nerve along with popliteal sciatic block for lower lip surgeries? And if the uh, when, is, when you are using saphenous nerve block, which, uh, what level you prefer for saphenous nerve block? I would prefer doing the adductor canal block uh, because uh, that is uh, so easy. Uh, you can do it uh, lower down in the thigh. And uh, the more important advantage is that you don't have palsy of the quadriceps femoris muscles uh, because uh, the only motor uh, uh, nerve that is um, affected when you do the adductor canal block is the nerve to vastus medialis, which is one of the four quadriceps. So I would prefer doing the adductor canal block. And uh, I would not always combine unless the incision is likely to involve the medial aspect of the leg. Uh, it's another question from uh, Dr. Anil Kumar. How long we need to wait for proper action of the adding nerve block? 20 minutes. It's the largest nerve in the body. And um, there is a septum which separates the um, 
tibial component from the peroneal component, I would say a minimum of 25 minutes because the drug has to seep from the periphery to the core. And that is when you will get the total sensory and motor block. So I think uh, giving 25 minutes is minimum before you proceed. Can we keep a catheter? A tourniquet? No, no, catheter. Catheter, yes, yes. You can. Uh, yes, you can do that. You could uh, place a catheter. Um, we would uh, normally do it uh, subgluteal uh, sciatic if we are doing it with ultrasound. Popliteal also is possible. Uh, uh, we have a busy vascular surgery team in our hospital. So they get a lot of uh, focus with uh, severe uh, intermittent claudication and uh, impending gangrene of uh, their toes. So these people are in tremendous pain. They just can't sleep uh, in one position and the moment I do a popliteal sciatic block and put in a catheter and give them some local anesthetic, I mean, they're so relaxed. They go to sleep immediately. So popliteal sciatic catheters is something uh, we do quite often. Okay, sir. And uh, Dr. Fayas uh, is requesting you to share your experience with pudendal nerve block. I really don't have any experience with pudendal <laughs> nerve block. I've never done it. Uh, I've only heard uh, Dr. Rani Sundar in Coimbatore. She had done an excellent lecture on ultrasound-guided uh, pudendal nerve blocks. But uh, I personally have no experience. Another question about the probe only. Is the high frequency in the curvy linear probe available with the Sonocyte machine? I think it's available. Yes. It's available. It, is available. it is available for the same cost as the C60 probe. Uh, so not many people know it is available. So um, that is why they don't order it. When our department uh, bought a machine two years ago, I insisted on that probe. I don't have a C60 probe uh, with uh, that particular machine. And any blocks for short knee arthroscopy or meniscectomy, et cetera, without tourniquet? For uh, knee arthroscopy, I think um, the best block would be uh, an adductor canal block because um, um, there is no tourniquet there. Um, it not only involves the saphenous nerve, it blocks the nerve to vastus medialis, and it also blocks the posterior branch of operator nerve, uh, which supplies the posterior capsule. So that would be a very good block. And uh, sometimes,